Attleboro's Community Talk Show. I'm Wendy O'Connell. Here we are in the middle of winter looking for things to do. <laughs> and what's coming up is the Harris Hill Ski Jump. Harris Hill is one of Vermont's 10 top winter events. And as president of the Harris Hill Board of Trustees, Pat Howell, who is with us here today, is currently in the eye of the storm for the jump's <laughs> 100th year celebration. A lot of stuff going on for this. We're going to talk to her about this exciting event, as well as Pat's connection to France, which brought her interesting careers and travel. And here in Brattleboro, where she and her husband, Mel Martin, owned a successful marketing business for many years. Welcome, Pat. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah. It's a thrill to be here with you. Well, not as much as the thrill of a thrill as the ski jump <laughs> is going to be, I hope. <laughs> um, yeah, this is very exciting, and um, I'm so glad that you're on the show and we can talk some of the details that people don't know so much about, um, as well as a sneak preview of the book that's coming out, that is out that now. That is out, yes. Big book uh, for uh, celebrating the 100 years of the Brattleboro Ski Jump. So we're going to hear all about this. You grew up in Delaware. I did. Yes. I grew up uh, in a uh, village on the outskirts of Wilmington, Delaware, mm -hmm. uh, that um, was founded as a single tax community by a, a leftist economist uh -huh. um, named Henry George, and mm -hmm. his followers were called Georgists. But the key uh, for me in growing up in that community was uh, that, that the philosophy that it em embodied focused on uh, community life, Mm -hmm. and the outdoors, and um, arts and crafts. Huh. Open spaces were called greens, where we could play softball. An intricate web of paths through the village mm -hmm. were called lanes, mm -hmm. and we could ride our bikes through the lanes, yeah. and uh, a creek where uh, we all learned to swim. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't a swimming pool, it was a yeah. creek. Yeah. And uh, the bohemian nature um, attracted uh, a bevy of intellectuals. Um, uh, Upton Sinclair mm -hmm. lived there, as did um, uh, Harry, K Harry Kemp, mm -hmm. the poet, mm -hmm. uh, lived in Arden. The woman who invented Monopoly grew <laughs> up in Arden. Anyway, it was a wonderful place to grow <laughs> up, um, and I'm guessing that uh, my love of the outdoors, mm -hmm. my love of Vermont, uh, my love of arts, the yeah. arts, and uh, probably my nonconformist leanings mm -hmm. all stem from my childhood in art. Your family, your dad was, um, was a writer. Yes, uh, he fashioned himself uh, a writer. Uh -huh. He didn't earn his living as a writer. Mm. Um, he was a uh, he earned his living in PR and radio. Uh -huh. A radio, too, yes. As well. And your mom was a teacher? My mom was a school teacher. Yes. Did you have siblings? I have a brother. A brother. Growing up, you were very influenced by your French teacher at a very young age. <laughs> I was. Hence your love of France, I believe, came from that. It did. Yeah. It did. Uh, I had a wonderful French teacher from seventh grade who, uh, when you walked into her class, uh, immediately, not knowing a word of French, uh, no English was allowed, and we learned French. To, we learned to think in French, mm. and I fell in love with this. Mm -hmm. uh, it was also easy for me. Languages came easy. Mm. Very soon out of college, you got a really interesting job in Washington D.C. I uh, moved to D.C. where my college roommate was living. Mm -hmm. uh, she was a flight attendant, and I said, "I've got to find a job." Um, started scouring the newspaper, the Washington Post, and saw a little ad uh, for um, uh, for the, a position with the Tunisian embassy, and I ended up uh, uh, being offered the job mm -hmm. of secretary to the Tunisian ambassador wow. uh, to Washington, which was a fabulous experience. Oh, I'll bet. And you're uh, like in your early 20s, I was, right? I was. Incredible. It was really wonderful. I was there during, um, this definitely shows my age, uh, but I was there during Eisenhower's funeral, oh. which you can imagine, uh, 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 
presidents and yeah. diplomats from all over the world yeah. came to Washington. Mm -hmm. And it was quite, um, Tunisia was high up in the a hierarchy mm -hmm. of um, countries that um, uh, Eisenhower was fond of uh -huh. uh, and that uh, were, were close. And so Tunisia got to sit in the front of the cathedral when I, in, in Eisenhower's funeral. And I had the, the incredible experience and privilege of arranging uh, diplomatic dinners and receptions uh -huh. and uh, uh, escorting these, the president of Tunisia, Habib Bourguiba was his name, uh -huh. to, uh, to the funeral. Uh -huh. I mean, it, it was an unbelievable experience. Yes, and I'm sure you've got a lot of stories about it. I do. Yes. Any quick ones you could share with us? Um, my favorite one, uh, Wendy, um, one of my part of my job was to organize uh, uh, diplomatic dinners mm -hmm. for that were held at the embassy residence, and um, this one was to in honor of the Shah of Iran. Now, this was the Shah. He was not such a good man. Mm. He was very handsome and very charming, but uh, politically, um, his deeds were not. Uh, uh, his deeds were not good. Mm -hmm. He was the um, he was the guest of honor, and there was a reception line uh, for the for the uh, dinner, where you walked through and you introduced yourself. Yeah. And my crazy roommate, who was the flight attendant, had said to me, "Pat, this is a big event. You have to put uh, you have to have false fingernails, so that your hands look good when you're shaking hands." I had never worn false fingernails in my life, Wendy. <laughs> and as I hand reached out to shake the hand of the um, uh, Shah of Iran, he accepted it graciously and squeezed it so hard <laughs> that many of the fingernails on my right hand ended up in his. <laughs> and I saw my life pass in front of me. My ambassador that I worked for was standing next to him. <laughs> and I just saw this huge passing of my career <laughs> and uh, what seemed like forever uh, in time they both uh, burst out laughing they did oh that's and wonderful and the Shah of Iran said young lady I <laughs> believe these are yours oh that's a wonderful story that's great wonderful that they laughed as well yes it yeah, was good that they had a sense oh, of yes. humor oh <laughs> yes so who was president then was it um, Johnson uh, it was. Johnson, it yeah, was. Yeah, yes. yeah. So yes. that was my It was guess. right in the middle of the Vietnam War oh, man. Uh, era. Oh, What a time to be there, Pat. Yes, what an was. amazing time. I'm, I'm blessed, Wendy. I've had wonderful jobs, uh, fascinating jobs. Mm -hmm. I feel really very, very fortunate. Yes. My first visit to Vermont, I fell in love and uh, said to my friends, uh, what do people do who live here? I want to live here. That's it was a really so good beautiful. question back then, too. Yes, it was. <laughs> How did you end up in Brattleboro? My husband got a job at the book press. Ah, yeah. And um, it was New Year's Day, 1983. Uh, we moved to Brattleboro. Mm -hmm. How my career started in Brattleboro uh, was through my volunteer work with United Way. Oh. Um, I figured that I didn't know it. I, I didn't know anyone, and I had volunteered for United Way in Burlington, mm -hmm. and thought, I guess I'll volunteer here as well. It's a fabulous, you know, United Way. No one can argue with the work they do, mm -hmm. and so I did, and I got to know a lot of really um, important, wonderful people mm -hmm. in this community, yes. and, um, and became really good friends with. Uh, many of them. Mm -hmm. Was that your entree into the ski jump? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. My entree into the ski jump was the ski jump was looking for someone who would find them some sponsors. Uh, it was growing; mm -hmm. they needed money. Uh, ticket sales were not going; were not covering yeah. all of the expenses, mm -hmm. and um, and I. Um, was recruited, if you will, 
uh, to to find some sponsors for the for the ski jump. And I said I'd do it on a on a business as a business deal. Mm. Uh, and then I realized that everyone with the ski jump was a volunteer. Mm -hmm. And right. I finally said, forget yes. it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm on board. Uh -huh. You got me. Uh -huh. I'm hooked. <laughs> this is a great, great little organization that is now uh, yes. significant. And, you know, interestingly, I, we get this question often of, in fact, I had it the other day from a reporter who didn't, uh, who, who said, can you meet me at the Hill? I'd love to see it and have you introduce me to it. And he said, um, is there a competition? Is there jumping this weekend if mm -hmm. I came? Mm -hmm. And I said, no. Um, and he said, well, when will there be jumping before the competition in February? And I said, no, 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 no. There is only one weekend a year that Harris Hill is used for ski jumping. And he said, why is that? Mm -hmm. And I said, because we're all volunteers. And when you put on a three-day tournament, or two-day tournament, excuse me, mm. um, as an all-volunteer organization, at the end of that two days, you don't have much uh, uh, energy left right. for anything else. Right, so. right. Just to, to start giving a shout out for the book um, that's come out. This book was, again, a big labor of love. Many people involved, many sponsors, uh, many people volunteering time. It's fascinating. There are so many wonderful photographs, historical photographs from the beginning days, which was 1922. It's 100 years now. Mm. Um, and just great stories. Mm. You know, Fred Harris was a real force of nature. And he, um, in 1922, he started uh, Brattleboro Outing Club, which is still alive and well and thriving today, and the U.S. Eastern Amateur Ski Association, and the hill itself for um, a cost of $2,200. <laughs> um, and we'll, we'll get back to that when we talk about the renovation, which occurred in 2005 which was a little more than that. Off the top of your head, can you think of any little stories, you know, that stick out for you um, in these many, many years of Harris Hill? Of the competition? Yeah, I or? think, you know, a couple of things that I ran into, like in uh, 1927, there was a flaming hoop. And so a couple oh. skiers went down the hill, and th I think it was a man and a woman, and through the hoop mm -hmm. and into the jump. And there are a number of stories that we uncovered in uh, researching the history yeah, uh, for the for the book yes. uh, that that just reflect the both the ingenuity, the can-do spirit, um, and uh, actually some breathtaking uh, underlying courageous, yes. if not stupid, <laughs> um, uh, jumping. Yes. Uh, yeah. So yes, the hoop, the fly, flaming hoop. Yeah. We they also did uh, what they called rapid fire, which in this day and age would never be allowed for mm -hmm. insurance reasons, mm -hmm. uh, um, where jumpers went off through one a, one after the other yeah. in a rapid fire. Oh, yeah. Uh, and you think, well, what if one fell? What what would happen to right. the other two or right. whatever? Right. But nobody's thinking that. Right. And one of the fab fabulous things. Uh, uh, that you see in the book are photographs of the uh, 20s and 30s where people, mostly men, are up in trees yeah. looking over uh, the hill. Uh, that was their spectator spot. Yes, right. And I think to myself, oh, that would never yeah. happen today. It, it, there are so many wonderful stories and fun facts uh, about the ski jump. One is that they've always welcomed women and in 1938, it was the first year that there were women in the competition, which is mm -hmm. kind of a cool thing. Um, I believe that they were uh, two sisters. Two sisters, Dorothy yes. Gray and her sister, whose first name I can't remember. Uh huh. Uh, and they did compete. They were disqualified, right? Because they had not, uh, uh, they were not members of the. Uh, yeah, they weren't registered. Registered, or, something. or yes, yeah, there yeah. was a technicality. Yeah. Dorothy came back a few years later, and she was the fifth, fifth in line out of 22 jumpers. Wow, that's good to know that Brattleboro was ahead of its ahead time of because its time. because women were not in the uh, Olympics, the mm -hmm. um, International Olympics, until 2014. That's correct. So this is really saying something. So the ski jump has been going along for many, many years, and in 2005, it becomes obvious that the structure itself needs renovation. You were on board for that as well. 
and I'll bet that was a bit of an endeavor. Over uh, the course of years, an outdoor facility of this nature is subject to, uh, that's made of wood, mm -hmm. is subject to deterioration. Mm -hmm. And it had deteriorated to the point where it was unsafe. Mm. Um, the committee launched a major campaign uh, to rebuild the hill. Uh, we had engineering done. Um, we had a plan, a design uh, for the hill. Um, and went about the fundraising mm. to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Step Up and Soar campaign was a local uh, effort. It was, um, we held a telethon mm. on BCTV mm -hmm. uh, to raise money. Uh, we raised about 275000 as I recall. Mm -hmm. And um, we're looking at uh, a situation in Brattleboro at a time when there was a lot of fundraising happening. The hospital was doing a, mm. a major campaign. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of other organizations were uh, involved in capital campaigns mm. of, of significance. Yeah. Um, and our, we were advised that we probably weren't going to reach our goal, which was, I think, around $500,000. Mm -hmm. um, that said, we couldn't let it die on our watch. Yeah. That just wasn't going to happen. Yeah. And so we persevered. Um, I did the great story, if I may. Please. Digress and tell yes. you a wonderful story. It's a fairy tale story. Uh -huh. At the time that we were realizing that um, we had tapped the community pretty, pretty thoroughly. Mm. Um, uh, and were advised uh, to maybe th that maybe this wasn't going to happen after mm. all, and um, I think that coincided with a press release that I had written that said our show won't be happening this year. Um, we just need to raise a little more money and maybe next year. Mm -hmm. And that was picked up not in those exact words, but that the gist of that story was picked up by AP, the Associated Press. Mm -hmm. And so it landed in other uh, newspapers in New England. Um, it was picked up by uh, one of the trustees. It was read by one of the trustees of the Manton Foundation, um, which is based in New York City, a private family foundation. Um, and their inquiry it led to me um, at the time, I was in France, and I got a phone call uh, that, sa uh, th that was the, from, from the foundation's offices in New York City saying, um, I represent the Manton Foundation, and they would like to know, almost to the exact words, Wendy, if they gave you the balance of the money you needed to build Harris Hill, could you have a tournament this year? It was November, <laughs> and I held my breath for a moment, which seemed like forever, and said, no, we couldn't possibly mm. build a new um, structure and hold a tournament in February, mm. mm -hmm. but will that jeopardize their interest, the, f the interest of the foundation? Yeah. Uh, the long story short is it did not, and um, the Manton Foundation ended up uh, um, funding the remaining uh, amount needed to, to build the hill. Yeah, out of the blue. It was it was a fairy tale yeah. come true. Yeah. Uh, we were sitting there not knowing mm. where we would turn next. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where where could we possibly turn? Right to get this yeah, done. Yeah, well, and the town, the local community had been so generous right. mm -hmm. to this point. Mm -hmm. okay. and it was amazing. That, that's so wonderful. And so you, you had it the following year. So that we did. You were back up and running in, uh, what year was it? 2009. 2009. Yeah. One thing that's changed over the years also is the trophy. Fred Harris somehow, for the first trophy, uh, had Cartier, the very famous jewelers, mm. uh, design the trophy. 
that's changed over the years, but he must have had some kind of connection with it. Can him. you imagine? Yeah. Can you imagine the connection? It is a stunning trophy, mm. and uh, we're hoping to have it here. Uh, Dana Sprague, who is our historian, mm. is working to get all of the trophies um, that have been uh, retired mm -hmm. back for the for the 100th celebration. Oh, great! Uh, but the detail of the Cartier. Yeah trophy yes. is just magnificent. I'll bet. Yes, I did read that Sandy Harris, who is Fred Harris's daughter, designed the most recent trophy too. She did. Mm -hmm. uh, she also designed the one that was retired in 2020 uh -huh. by uh, a Slovenian, Blaz Plavic. Uh -huh. um, but she's in the process right now of designing the new one. Uh -huh. We're looking forward to Sandy's design and yes. uh, to to whoever's going to put the first leg on this new trophy. Yes, exciting. <laughs> I, I read this uh, great sentence, and I believe Kevin O'Connor wrote it. I'm not sure. And I pose it to you as a question. Um, what's your warmest memory of the coldest day at Harris Hill? Mm. My warmest memory of the coldest day, I'd like to turn it a little bit. Sure. I've been involved with Harris Hill Ski Jump since 1986. Every year when the tournament happens, it doesn't matter if it's the coldest day or the, a warmer day when we know the jumps are not going to be as spectacular because mm. it's too warm. Mm. It doesn't matter. My fondest m memory or feeling, and it's powerful, is standing at the base of the hill mm -hmm. when the jumpers are called out one by one to the outrun by Peter Graves, who is a professional announcer. He announces uh, at the Olympics mm -hmm. and is a local boy, mm -hmm. local man. Um, when Peter Graves belts out the names of the jumpers and then introduces the young woman who's going to sing the start the national anthem uh -huh. and I look up the hill and the national anthem starts to play and I can <laughs> all I can feel it now mm -hmm. the pride the sense of pride and achievement and accomplishment mm -hmm. that all the people who make this happen yeah uh, must feel as well. Mm, mm -hmm. That's the moment. Mm. That is the most cherished. That's wonderful. Special moment. Yes, yes. I can feel it. I can feel that you're <laughs> feeling it. Yeah, I know. I know. There was, um, there was a great quote. I don't know if I have it here. That Fred Harris instilled something in that jump that was contagious. It inspired people to give years of their lives to it to keep it alive. Oh. And you know, you're that's saying great. the same thing. And you know, another thing I think that's remarkable about the jump is that there's so many families, you know, who have um, different members of the family over generations at these jumps. Um, and it's, it's such a big part of our community. Um, and uh, I do want to um, uh, mention that BCTV has been live streaming the jump for quite a few years now. And That's right. we don't have the exact numbers, but we think it's around um, one of the, the last, last year, obviously, there was no jump because of the pandemic, but it was 30,000 viewers for one of these tournaments. Um, and this, of course, now is international. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are people from all over the world coming to Brattleboro, Vermont, for this ski jump to either be par participants or to come and view it. And so um, it's, it's yet another really interesting thing that Brattleboro mm -hmm. is on the map for. And, it you know, truly is. Yeah. It's, it's a true, truly a celebrated Brattleboro tradition yeah. um, that is part of the fabric of this community mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, beloved in this town. Yeah, it is. There are so many folks involved. And again, volunteers, volunteers. And uh, we would love, between you and I, we would love to give a list of these people. Um, but we we just can't. <laughs> it just would take can't. way too long. Yeah, and we're afraid that we would forget somebody. So, however, Pat has a beautiful paragraph um, mm. from the book itself um, that I think says everything. So this is the dedication 
of um, the Harris Hill Ski Jump, the first 100 years. Um, and it says, to the legions of volunteers, the planners and pluggers, snowmakers, packers, groomers and plowers, the starters, the scorekeepers and meter markers, ticket takers and parkers, announcers and anthem singers, photographers, designers, publicists, EMTs, and everyone else not named, but always necessary, who give their time, their energy, and expertise to make Harris Hill the iconic, beloved Brattleboro tradition that it is. We dedicate this book to you with boundless appreciation. I love it. <laughs> I love so it. It's beautiful. It's so true. There are so many mm. hundreds of people mm -hmm. who in this community who turn out on the weekend. Yeah. And then a whole nother uh, group of people who work year round yeah. to ensure that it continues. Yes. This year, the ski jump is February 18th through 20th. There's an extra day this year. It's the Friday before uh, the weekend. So can you tell us a little bit about that? It's called the Target Jump on Friday night. Uh, well, Friday night we'll, we'll be hosting our first uh, night jumping. Uh, we have lights ah. uh, that have just been installed. Uh, uh, courtesy of the hard work of Alan and Sally Seymour mm -hmm. and the uh, po lighting poles donated by Consolidated Communications. Um, we've never had night jumping at Harris Hill uh -huh. and in commemoration of the, uh, to celebrate the 100th anniversary, yes. we will be jumping. It will not be competitive jumping, it will be exhibition jumping mm -hmm. and uh, that'll be for fun, not uh -huh. for points and style and It'll just be a fun time. We will paint a bullseye on the hill, and the jumpers will try to see how close they can come. Mm -hmm. And the winner, of course, is the one who's closest. That's, It'll be fun. That's great. And we are sharing this evening celebration with the Brattleboro Outing Club, which uh -huh. is also celebrating 100 years. Yes. Of course, mm -hmm. because Fred Harris, who started Harris Hill Ski Jump, also started the Brattleboro Outing Club in yes. the same year. Yes, yes, that's exciting. So there's an extra bonus this yes. year. So February 18th through 20th, folks, that's Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, you, it's always pretty much always uh, Winter Carnival week um, here in, in town. So, Pat, thank you so much. It's been so much fun. Yeah. I, as you can tell, I love talking about the ski jump. Well, we could talk a <laughs> lot more. Yes, we could. We could talk a lot more. There's yes. so many stories. So in, in, in saying that, I would so encourage folks to um, go to your local bookstore, Everyone's Books, Anecdote Books. I'm sure that um, also some of the outlying independent bookstores up in Bellows Falls and Wilmington will be carrying this as well. Um, get a copy of this book. It's so much fun to read, and it's just so cool to see all of the photographs and how much has changed just <laughs> from the skis themselves yes. to what people are wearing. Um, and yes. yes, so please come to the ski jump. Um, we invite everybody and it's gonna be a great time for everyone. Um, thank you, Pat, for My joining pleasure. us. My yeah, pleasure. It was, it was wonderful. Please um, do, please yeah. do come. Uh, this is a, a momentous occasion, the celebration of 100 years yes. of ski jumping in our community. Yes. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, we really appreciate um, our audience as always. It's wonderful. Um, again, the ski jump is just uh, not only a great event in so many all the ways that we've talked about, but it sure breaks up the winter, <laughs> which is something that we can always use here in Vermont. So thanks again. We'll see you next week.